Praise the Lord. Let's just give the Lord a hand clap again. Amen. I love worshiping. The Lord. And before I, I, I say thank you to everyone, what a sweet presence of the Lord is here. We get to go to lots of different churches, and I don't say it to every church unless it's applicable, but what a powerful presence of the Lord is here. It's not something that you get everywhere you go, and just to the sweetness of the Spirit of God in this church is, it can only be attested to people that linger in his presence and are praying and wow it's refreshing um i told brother boyd that he was asking how is the how's the room and i was like you know there's hotels and all this stuff but what you can't get at a hotel is the the peace of god like that's in this room that's powerful now you guys gonna have a hard time getting rid of us because <laughs> it's so nice so well y'all may be seated Amen. And uh, thank you for standing. Also, uh, Brother Boyd and Sister Boyd, thank you for allowing us to come and be with you today. And all of you, thank you for having us come here today. If, if it was just Pastor and his wife, it's not going to be that exciting. So thank you guys for being here. Um, but before I go into preaching, I just ask that you guys would pray with me. Um, I am just a person, so I'm not perfect, and I, I definitely, need, definitely need the Lord's help more probably than anyone else in this room. So if you guys can pray with me that I'm just a vessel for God to speak through, whatever God says, no matter if I like it or not, that I'll be obedient to his voice. Amen. Jesus, I thank you for this time. And I know there's things I think I'm going to preach about, but whatever you want to be spoken today from this pulpit, I pray, God, that you'd have your perfect will in this time and that I would be an obedient vessel, not to try to filter, not to try to make softened, but just to speak directly the word that you would give to this precious body of believers. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Let your glory fall down in this service and let your holy and perfect will be accomplished. In Jesus' Jesus, your wonderful name we pray. Amen. And can we give the Lord another hand clap? Praise God. So jumping right into it, I would like to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse um, 19 through 21. And it says here, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen. So that's, uh, you know, I believe every, every word that the Bible says. Not just the words that make me feel good, not just the things that help me to stay in a place of comfort, but every single word in the Bible. And my purpose is not just to share Japan with the body of Christ. 
When I first got to America, God told me, you're not going to speak about Japan as much as you think, but you're going to challenge my church because the church in North America needs to wake up. You know, there's many times I wish God would just be like, Travis, you get to talk about bunnies, rainbows, and fluffy clouds. But he never gives me that. He gives me the stuff that a lot of other people will not say. I am not, as I go through this message, I'm not trying to be rude or sarcastic, nothing like that, but just direct and honest. Amen. Um, that being said, I also recognize who my audience is. No offense, but I'm starting to see a lot of grays and whites and hair. That means I'm, I'm talking to my heroes. I'm talking to people that have gone before me and done so much in life, and I, I give you all great respect and honor. So please, if I ever say anything, I am not trying to be snarky or rude. I would not do that. I know our generations coming up don't appreciate their elders, but I do. So I just want you guys to know that. But it says here, lay not up yourselves treasures in this earth, but, but put them towards the things of heaven, eternal rewards. That's what we, we have to get our minds again back on the eternal. But North America has been plagued with prosperity. And if we get so consumed in our prosperity, we find ourselves building our own little kingdoms and thinking that for somehow that this mass of things that we collect and labor for all day long, that this is going to affect us positively when we get to heaven. And it's one of the greatest deceits that has hit the North American church that we need to have more and more and nicer and nicer things. Don't get me wrong. I like nice things. I'm wearing the newest Galaxy watch. Amen. I didn't have a watch my entire life that had anything smart on it. It's my first one, and I hope it lasts me like six years. But I like it. But it's not my purpose in life. If I dropped this, and it broke, and it shattered, and went away, eh, that's my heart towards it. Because I'm not living my life for things. But in the, it's even in the church that we get to where we hold on to far too much. When God's saying, I have prospered you, that you can prosper my work, that my kingdom can go further. That's the purpose of the blessing of the people of God. It's not that we can become so comfortable and full of things, but that we can prosper where the need is at. And God, when his people start to do that, will bless you even more abundantly in ways we can't even imagine. There is a chain of bondage that comes along with finances. Financial burden. There's a financial chain that's in our life. Not being um, able to move outside of what our finances says we're able to do right? It's heavy. And it's not until we do things in our life to show God, this is not my Lord. This is not my provider. You are. And the only way we can show that God is our provider is give him the opportunity to provide. That's what faith is, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. So God will put us in pickles or sticky places and say, do you really trust me to be your provider? Or do you trust your job? Or do you trust the government? Or do you trust the almighty dollar? Which, by the way, I don't think it's going to be around that much longer. It's just not. How sad will it be that whenever they start making everything digital and they come in and they just wipe out your bank account that you've been saving your whole life for, and then you no longer have the opportunity to give into the kingdom? Giving into the kingdom of God is the most safest thing and most productive thing you could ever do with your money. There's no better place to put it. That when you, this life, so short. I've only lived for 33, soon to be 34 years. 
But I have friends that I was in the military with that died at the age of 20, 21, 22, 25. And no one would ever imagine. They say, O'Brien's dead. No way. How? And it wasn't even from combat. Just heart gave out like that. We don't know when our last day is to invest into the things of God. Amen. And I'm not, it's not all about money, but I want to just say something that I'm going to vouch for. I hope every other missionary that comes here, this will help them. And every other evangelist that comes here, that this can help them. We come here for two primary reasons. One is to be a blessing to the work of God, to bless the people, to, to see that there's a move of the presence of God, to challenge the church, hoping that when we leave that you guys are in a better spot spiritually than when we first got here. And secondly, and I say it with, with, with not much shame, we're here because we want your money. Right? That's not the sugar-coated way. I'm not like here like, hey, if you got, you know, some change in your floorboard, can you go find it for me? No. I hope that you guys give to what God is doing in Japan to where it makes your pocketbook look scary. Because there's a principle behind it that when you give like that, you're going to enter into a different level of blessing. That when whoever comes here after me, I hope they get a double portion of what I got. Because that's how God blesses. God can't bless a stingy heart. But God blesses those who give to his kingdom. What more can you do that is going to make God pleased than to give to the building of the kingdom of God? There's nothing. But if we stay in that, that mindset that we've got to hold on to everything and we've got to care for ourselves and we've got to build these nests and all this stuff that you hear so much, it bombards our minds. Life insurance, this insurance, that insurance, this kind of investment, that kind of investment, this thing and that thing. And it's like, oh, i got to have all of this. And you have so many people that go to the grave with millions of dollars in their bank account. Literally, millions of dollars. Whenever you get to heaven, you've got so little. When you could have given everything we're working for here on this life and go to heaven and be rich. It's powerful, but it's challenging. But that's what God told me to do is to come and challenge the church. Because great revival is coming to America. But for great revival, there takes a great level of finances. And God's looking for those who are going to say, I'll be a conduit for your money. And then the more God can funnel through you and it doesn't ruin you, the bigger of a conduit you will become. And I have learned that in the times of caring for the money of the kingdom, you can have nice things. But God's looking at your heart and saying, as soon as I need to take it, are you willing to give it? Amen? So I, I, myself, I remember I went to this place in Georgia Oh, man, time goes by quick. I'm going to talk a little faster. You guys good with this? I went to Georgia. I was getting out of the Marines or out of boot camp, and I went to this place to get job training, and I went to the first apostolic church I think I ever went to in my life. I wasn't raised apostolic. I didn't come. I didn't have an apostolic church in the home. I came into the apostolic faith in Japan through the military from a missionary in the UPCI. Praise God. That's awesome, right? But in that process, I went to this guy. I met him at a hair salon or barber shop, and his name was Bob Beard. And I remember telling him, hey, man, I'm looking for a church to go to. I want to go to a church where people aren't just trying to jump out the door as fast as they can to get to the restaurants. And he looked at me, and he's like, huh, I think I got a church for you. And I was like, cool. Well, and he said, I'll come pick you up. So I went there, and I looked back on it. I know this is a United Pentecostal church. The people were so friendly, so, so friendly. I was like, hmm, give me my little space of just to soak it up. But there, how are you doing? Everyone shook my hand. I didn't go away hating them. I just went away feeling a little uncomfortable because I wasn't used to that level of love. But the pastor at the end of this time, big black dude from Alabama State, he was a linebacker or something. He was the pastor. He said, hey, you know, Travis, I would like to invite you to my home. It's like, cool. So I went to this man's home. It was, a mere, it was like a dream. We get on his road, 
You know when you say turn on my road? It was actually like his road. Because the entire road was bordering the rolling hills and white picket fence that was his property. His church was smaller than this. I'm like sitting there thinking to myself, how in the world did this guy afford this land? Not only was there rolling hills, there were horses galloping across them. It was a sight to see. Then we pull up to his house, which was a mansion. It was like four stories. Amazing. I remember walking out. We get, I'm just looking at Bob. I'm like, what in the world? And he's like, yeah, it's a pastor's house. Like it was nothing. I was like, this is, this is something. I got into this house and I felt, I stepped on the carpet and I just felt the peace of God so heavy. I told the guy, I was like, if I could just absorb into your carpet and become a part of your home, I would do it. I have never felt the peace of God like this anywhere in my life. And he kind of chuckled. And I said, after that, how did you afford this house? (laughs) See, I ask questions that people wish they could, but they never do. Because if someone asked me, I'd tell them exactly how I afforded it. doesn't bother me none. And he told me, well, you might not believe it if I told you. But if you want to hear, I'll tell you. I was like, please tell me. I, I got to know. Because I'm putting two and two together, and it wasn't equal in four. How does a lonely little pastor with a church congregation of 20 have a multi-million dollar property? And he said, well, the way I got this one is the house I had before this, I gave it away. And the house I had before that, I gave it away. And the house I had before that, I gave it away. Not only did I give away my home, I gave away my car, my clothing, everything. It was my bank account. I gave everything I owned away for the kingdom of God, except for the clothes on my back and my children's back and my wife's back. And I was like, so, and he's like, and then God just started to do things. And he'd always give me back a nicer house in each time. And I'm sitting there thinking like, what? amazing. And I was like, God, don't take this house from me. Let him keep this one, which was foolish because if he took that one, maybe he's going to have a castle somewhere. It was just the order of which God would do things. God seen where his heart was at in the beginning. And each time he increased him. And he said to me, Travis, God showed me that everything I have, it's not mine. It's just his and he's loaning it to me. And whenever he comes and he wants to take it back, it's his. He's my provider. You think he's going to leave me naked and stranded in life? No. If this is what he wants, he can have it. And that stuck in my brain and in my spirit like a little earwig, just constantly gnawing at my thoughts. And I remember I went into my barracks. I was, I was in Okinawa at the time, and I heard this message about, are you going to serve God or mammon? Will you serve God or are you going to serve money? And I went to my shower because God was just giving me this heavy conviction. And I started to fight it out. I was praying in tongues. My headmates probably thought I was insane because I was just getting a hold of God in my bath. And God's like, are you going to serve me or are you going to serve money? And I told God, I want to serve you. He said, prove it. And I had been saving all my money up for a very special occasion in my life. And God said, give it all to the church. They need an air conditioner, which they did. And it's so funny that you spoke about how nice air conditioning is. Okinawa was very hot as well. And it was stifling in that church building. And I said, God, I'll do it. And I remember when I meant that with my heart, it was like a chain literally broke in my life. It was like I was set free from something. Truly, financially set free. Not like what people want to say on the the news or whatever, like, you want financial freedom so you have millions of dollars in your bank? Not like that. The fact that I knew I no longer needed money to accomplish what God's purpose was for my life, that he would take care of it. So I gathered all my money up out of my bank account as a Lance Corporal, and it it all totaled me and another person $3,300. And I gave that, had nothing. Two, two months later, someone gave me $5,000. Praise God, right? But my heart was not giving to receive something. I gave to be obedient to God. I gave to be a blessing to what God's heart was. Amen. And then time went on. And I learned how to give more, more, and more. I always gave my tithes. I learned to do that as a kid because I didn't want to be cursed. But I went on, and I'm getting out of the Marine Corps, and then God shows me the church needs chairs, and I want you to give money for it. I have one more check 
and I'm getting out of the Marine Corps. And I had $3,000 saved up. Because Marines are kind of dumb sometimes. But I was smart enough to know it's going to be expensive when I get out. And God says, I need your money. I was like, Lord, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. So I was like, all right, I know this is God. Because this is a thing. You know when God's talking to you? When as soon as God speaks, you feel this level of joy, peace, and excitement. And then the moment after that, there's something trying to reason you out of obeying the voice of God. That reasoning out is because the devil sees what's happening in the spirit. He sees God bringing this cloud of blessing to your life. And he's going to do everything he can to try to thwart that from your life. Because he knows if you step into that obedience, you're going to be a mighty force for the kingdom of God. So what I did, I instantly called my pastor. Hey, I'm not even in the church. I'm in America. This is church chairs for Japan. And I said, God told me to give you guys some money for the church chairs that I heard about. Oh, really? Are you sure? And I was like, yeah. He's like, how much? I was like, 3000 Are you sure you're getting out? I was like, hey, please don't try to talk me out of this. I know what God told me to do. I'm going to give it. He's like, okay. So I wired him the money that day. I'm still alive. I'm actually gaining weight. I did not run out. I did not become homeless. God provided me all along the way. And that's how God's always going to do things. Then I met my wife. She's not here, so I can say this. I'd probably say it if she was here anyways. But she was stingy. Oh, my goodness, stingy. Like nickel and dime you to oblivion. You owe me $3.31. Where's the one cent at? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. She's like, no, well, why would I not want $3.31? That's what I gave you, right? Technically, yes, but how about you just take $3 or I'll give you $5 and back instead. She just thought it was so foreign. And I was like, we got to work on this. I cannot live like this. I said, if we owe someone $5, we'll give them 10 If someone owes us $5, we say it's fine. Keep it. It's just good. It's nice to be a blessing to people. She started to learn this, and we started together giving lots of money to people in our church, to people in other churches, people that were hard on bills and debt, just giving. We give a lot out, and I love to do it. And I'm not, look, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. God is trying to challenge the church. He is trying to get us into a place of financial freedom that he can do whatever we need to do, and that we can trust him, not just in this day, but what, what's in five years. Who's our provider? We're going to need a trust in the name of Jesus. We're going to need a trust in his provision and not what the government says. So we get to this point where giving and giving and giving, and she's starting to see this, like, wow, God just takes care of me. It's amazing. Yes, it is. And we need to give more. We never stop giving more. And she's like, I get it. So we look for the opportunities to give into the kingdom of God. One week before, something close to that, we're coming to America to raise funds. God comes and he talks to me. Hey, Travis, guess what? What? I need your money. I'm like, okay. But I, I know when God's talking to me, it's very clear. I've learned his tone of voice when it comes to financial things. It always hits right here. And I told God instantly, I was like, okay, well, maybe this number. I was like, no, no, no. Even myself, I was like, that's that's way too low. I'm sorry, God. Forgive me. But what about this much? And God just said very frankly to me, do you want half the blessing? All right, I'm sold. Let me talk to my wife about it. And this day I told my wife, I'm like, hey, Chi-Chi. And she's like, oh, no, money? Yeah, God wants some money. She said, how much? And I told her. And she said, are you sure you heard from God? I said, yes. <clears throat> and then she said, well, if you're sure you heard from God, let's do it. I was like, wow, you've come a long way from like going into depression and this and that and not trusting that it's going to work out to just, if you heard it was God, let's do it. Because she learned something that no matter what, whenever we're giving it to the Lord, everything's going to be fine. God told us to give $10,000, not to my church. A different church. Not money that's going to funnel back into my church. It's going to stay in that church. 
And I told the pastor, I don't want to, I don't care what you do with it. But I would hope that this money can go to evangelism and to the youth. Because they were in revival. And they had kids that didn't have good clothes. They had kids that didn't have nice shoes. These were Japanese kids that wanted to go to a, to a conference for the first time in their life, but didn't have money to fly from Okinawa to mainland Japan. And I was like, what an exciting thing to give to the next generation of preachers and evangelists and prophets that Japanese kids are going to reach their own people. What greater thing could I give my money to? And I know that the moment I gave that money to them with the right heart, my treasure was stored up in heaven. If they took it out and they just ate fancy food the rest of their life and bought nice suits and ties, that's on them. But when we give out of the heart for our money to go and do a certain thing for the kingdom, God puts it instantly into heaven. Doesn't matter what the other party does with it. He gives back to us out of the heart that which we gave it from. And God wants us to do that. So I, I challenge you, I don't, I don't beg you for your finances, but I challenge you to give to the things that God is doing in Japan. PIMs, we need PIMs desperately. That's the only way we can get back. And we need offerings too, because we're traveling in America, which is, by the way, incredibly expensive now. I didn't live here for seven years, and I come back and I'm like, a candy bar is $2? Just a normal candy bar? I grew up in there 25 cents. Amen. Now, and I can't, I might not get to the rest of my scriptures. Um, investing in the things of God is just not finances. It's also our time. How we spend our time. Every time we pray, every time we read our Bible, every time we talk to somebody that we don't know with the hope that they can come to know the Lord, that's investment in heaven. And God sees the heart of which we do everything. When we give ourselves to the needs of others, those are investments in heaven, eternally stored up. And this is something God talked to me right over there as I was sitting on the pew, and I know it was God. I have to talk to the men for a moment. And again, <laughs> this is rough because you guys are a little bit older than me. I've done a lot. What God was putting in my heart, and I'm just pleased if you can look past me, close your eyes or something, and just, just hear from God. He wanted me to challenge you to find somebody to invest yourself into. There's so much experience sitting in front of me. Hundreds of years, if you were to add all of your lives together, of experience that you've gone through the thick, you've gone through the thin, you've overcome obstacles, giants, pushed through and things that many people couldn't even fathom. And God wanted me to challenge you to find somebody young, a young man that you can invest yourselves into, that will fill these pews up, that whenever you, you leave, there's a legacy of your life living inside of them, that they can bring in the next revival into this area, that they can build spiritually and walk through things that you walk through. And because of your experiences being invested into them, when they hit mountaintops and valleys, they know how to deal with it. That's what God told me to challenge you specifically. I've not said this to any church before. But God's got it for you. Don't let your life pass away when you go to be with the Lord. I say this with much respect as I can. And it's just the truth. You know, when brothers and sisters who are older, help me God, anybody that's in a relationship with Jesus, if they're young, old, middle-aged, they pass on, I don't feel grief. I'm excited for them. Why, they're not like, why are you crying? I'm in heaven. I'm not sad. But what is grieving to God is that if we pass on, there was no one that we invested ourselves into. That's one of the greatest criminal acts that a Christian man or woman can do 
And this is for the ladies as well. Find a woman that you can invest in, that whenever she finds that right guy, that she makes him the most powerful man that he can be because he's got a wife that knows how to support and how to strengthen and how to um, speak to and respect and to help him to be the greatest man that he's supposed to be. There's so much experience in this room. And God is challenging you today to pour that into somebody. And that's where the investment's going to come. You're going to need to give your finances to take them out for tea time, coffee, breakfast. You're going to have to give up your early mornings to go sit with them somewhere and to talk to them about their life and really care about what's going on. To mentor them into a place where they can look back and say, only reason I'm where I'm at is because God brought so-and-so into my life and they poured themselves into me. And because of them, I was able to weather every situation around. I believe God is starting to speak to you right now. People that's in your life that you could find and pull aside and be like, hey, I want to start spending time with you. I said what God put on my heart to say. So I'm done. It is 830. I'm never punctual. It's a miracle. Praise God. So I challenge you also, if there's a number that you want to give to the work that God is doing in Japan, I will receive it. I get that. And I have no shame receiving it. I believe I am a man of God called to the highest work that you could ever do, and that is to minister to the people of God and go into a country with 126 and a half million people that honestly, none of them know the name of Jesus. That's a high calling. And I'm giving up my entire life. And by the way, I'm a patriot through and through. If I wasn't, I wouldn't have joined the Marine Corps. And I miss the things of America at times. I miss just going to a gun shop and buying whatever I want to go blast things. I can't do that in Japan. I miss smelling gunpowder. But you know what? Gunpowder is not as important as someone being in heaven for eternity because I'm willing to give that up. So I have no problem coming here and requesting or challenging you to give into the kingdom of God through the work that we're doing in Japan. I could talk for 20 more minutes. I'm not going to because I respect your time, and I know you guys got a lot of trees to clean up tomorrow. And I appreciate your time. This is our Partners in Missions. If anyone wants to support us on a monthly basis, please get with your pastor. And if you guys want to, you can come together and all feed the money to the pastor if he works that way. I don't know. I'm not trying to step on your toes. Because we have to have 80% of these from a church. If we get $500,000 in support and it's all from individuals, they're like, we don't care. You have to have 80% come from a church. Because people flake off so easy. Like, oh, we paid for a couple months. We're done. So if you want to support us, to get us back to Japan, we have to have PIM supported. And we're probably about 30% of the way there. A lot of money to raise. So, and if you guys want to give to us love offerings, we welcome that. Gas is expensive. Food's expensive. Everything's expensive. My car has broken down every single month. I've spent over $9,000 in car repairs. When I get back to Kentucky... I am getting rid of it. Right now, the transmission's falling out. And it's scary to drive a car with a failing transmission when you got a wife who's Japanese, a one-year-old, and a pregnant belly. You want the car just to drive. Now I got to drive it like a stick shift. When it starts revving out of control, you got to let off the gas. and Come on, come, 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 you got your gear. That's not fun when you're going like 700 miles. So anyways... We need finances, and I welcome you to invest into the kingdom of God through the ministry that we're doing. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. Thank you for your time, and I hope that soon there is a generation underneath you that has all of your knowledge and stories. Praise God. Y'all are wonderful. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let's all stand. Can we do that? Aren't you thankful for the for those that are willing to go? Yes. Amen. Not everybody can go, and this has been a long time uh, saying of, 
of global missions. Not everybody can go, but everybody can give. And I'm thankful that we're part of a giving church, and I appreciate the fact that we don't just think about missionaries on mission service nights, but all throughout the year. And you're in our prayer, and we pray that God will continue to anoint and bless Brother and Sister Craig and let them have the influence that they not that they need not only in Japan, but the influence they need right here in America and their support. And so I'm just going to ask us as we dismiss this evening that we pray and ask the Lord to keep his hand upon them and ask God to just touch their lives, their life, and their ministry and their family. And we know that they will, that he will. They want to be here for a few days just kind of hanging out. So we're praying that the Lord, they're going to be working in and out. didn't mean to say hanging out, but working in and out of here. But let's just pray and ask the Lord to keep his hand on them as they travel. Would you do that, Lord? We thank you for the privilege that you've given us. Amen.